Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life Church. My name is Grant, one of the pastors here at New Life. Now, if I've never met you before, like, I would love to get to know you. I'd love to hear your story, find out more about you, find out how you ended up at New Life. And a great way for, for me to know that as well is, is head to our website, fill out a connection card, let us know that you are here with us this morning. Well, I can't believe it. it's already December. Isn't that crazy? Like, I cannot believe that. And it's great because it's Christmas time, right? I've got a Christmas baby, Emery, right? She's born on Christmas. I love this time of year. I already told you, like, what, two months ago I put my lights up, something like that. Finally got our Christmas tree up, which this is the latest we've actually done that in my household. And some of you are like, Grant, it's, you're crazy. And it's like, I know. I love Christmas. But I think we all should. I think we all should love Christmas. And so we have many opportunities for you to be a part of, especially in this Christmas season. One of those is tomorrow night, Free Ladies. That's Cup of Christmas. Today's the last day to sign up. We have a sign up out in the great room, so make sure uh, you're able to be a part of that. One thing my wife does every single month is mom's group on Saturdays, and that's going to be this Saturday. If you are interested in that, make sure you check out the weekly email for more details. My wife, she comes home every, every Saturday, just recharged and just absolutely loves it. So if that interests you, um, check out the, the weekly email for details. But with Christmas coming up, we are going to have Christmas Eve services, but then we're also going to have Christmas Day service because that is also on a Sunday this year, which is great. Uh, but we will not have any uh, kids uh, ministry for that morning, so kids will join us for the Sunday service. Uh, but all that information is in the weekly email. Uh, we do have the gift for Jesus that we've been doing this last month, or this month, I should say, and so we've got a video for that. Check it out. As promised, we wanted to highlight each of the six Gift for Jesus projects in the weeks leading up to Christmas. If you're new to New Life, Gift for Jesus is a special offering that we take at Christmas to help support our global workers and the projects they'd love to do but don't have the resources to accomplish. For more than 40 years, New Life Church members have given sacrificially, above and beyond their tithe, to make these projects a reality. This week, let's learn more about the Myrtle Beach Ministry House. We are so grateful for New Life's investment in our family and the ministry of YWAM Myrtle Beach through the Gift for Jesus project this year. Here at YWAM Myrtle Beach, we recognize that there are entire people groups throughout the world who have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, as well as many places of injustice and marginalization right here in our own backyard. Our mission is to train others to go with us to these tough places, near and far, until God is known, worshipped, and glorified by everyone, everywhere. Over this past year, God spoke to us about putting down roots in Myrtle Beach for long-term growth. So we started praying for a miracle as we watched the housing market skyrocket in our area. In August, God answered our prayers by presenting YWAM with a surprising opportunity to purchase a 3,000 square foot house for just $379,000. This house will be a home for our young staff who come to serve in our training programs and ministries. It will be a place of refuge for international student workers whom we are engaging for the gospel. And it will be a training base for future missionaries who enroll in our discipleship training school. After we paid the deposit in August, we were able to take occupancy of the house immediately. In this short time, we have seen God use it for his purposes. We are currently housing new staff members there who wouldn't be able to afford to live in Myrtle Beach otherwise. In October, we provided safe and supportive housing to three international student workers from Honduras. And just last week, we had our first gathering at the house with our kids from the Carver Unity Project. We believe God has given this home to us and that he will provide the funds we need to pay for it in full by January 15th, 2023. Thank you for being a part of this miracle with us. We hope you're as excited about these projects as we are. Our goal for the six projects is $55,000. And just a reminder that the gift for Jesus is not intended to replace our normal tithes and offerings that go towards meeting our general budget, but to be truly a gift that goes above and beyond what we have planned. Giving toward the gift for Jesus is easy. You can use any of these options to direct your giving towards this year's great projects. Our season for Gift for Jesus will run through the first week in January. Once again, we're excited to see how God surprises us 
and works through us to make these great projects a reality. Thanks again for your prayerful consideration and support. Good morning once again to everyone and welcome to New Life Church of Woodbury. My name is Luke Bostrom. I'm one of the pastors here as well. Would you stand as we sing together and worship?
oh come, Savior of this world. And I was just thinking 2,000 years ago, that hope, that longing, that expectation. And we're on the other side of that, and we get to sing not only O Come Emmanuel and O Come Savior of Nations, but we get to sing He has come, He is here, and we are no longer slaves. We've been set free from bondage and captivity. Amen? Well, that is a declaration that angels brought from on high. And so would you sing with us this declaration, Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in their pines, echo back the joyous strains. God, glory in the highest. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Woo! Welcome. My name is Brett. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life, and it is really good to have all of you here in the room, right here in this moment. But in this next moment, some of you are going to leave. So kiddos, get on out of here. You can take off. Head to the back or out to the side. Parents, you can pick them up. After the service, they head on out to be a part of teaching age appropriate. And yet they get to stay in here with us and hang out while we sing together because we think it's hugely important that we're all together as the body from very beginning to the end. And they also get to woo with us, which was kind of cool this week. I had a friend that was out of the country and had a chance to go to a church service while they were out of the country. And guess what they did at this church service that they were at on the other side of the world? They wooed. They wooed. And he was like, oh, man, here we go. God, I just can't even get away from it. Well, you know, we woo because we're excited to be here. We look forward to being here on Sunday as we dig into God's word. But we should be excited every day. Every day is an opportunity to woo, especially during the Christmas season. This is a woo kind of season. If you are not excited right now, then you may not have a pulse. Something is wrong with you. You should be excited right now, which I do want to settle a debate real quick before we get into the message. 
Little debate's been raging this week between a couple different people. When is the official start of Christmas? Was it last weekend or is it this weekend? Okay, is it the weekend right after Thanksgiving or is it the first week of December? So I need a, I need a show of hands so we can settle, the, settle this this morning. When's the first, first weekend of Christmas, official start? Was it last weekend? If you think so, say yes. Okay, how about this weekend? You think so, say yes. All right, it is not settled. <laughs> we don't know when the first weekend of Christmas is. Oh, I'm sure you guys are going to drive away today full of angst. Because you've not answered that question. Well, regardless of when the first weekend of Christmas is, it is Christmas. And there are a lot of sights and sounds and unique things about Christmas that, if you really think about it, are actually kind of strange. Have you guys thought about the oddities at Christmas that we think are normal? Like, think through the fact that all of a sudden we have a fascination with coniferous vegetation. You guys even know what I said there? Evergreens, evergreens, they show up everywhere, right? All of a sudden, we're fascinated with evergreens. Look around the room. We decorated a couple weeks ago. There are evergreens all over the place. How many people have evergreens in their home all year round? Yeah, see, isn't that weird? It's weird. Second weird part of it that you may not have thought about is we light them up. We light them up. We put lights on them. We put lights on reeds, as you can see. We put lights on trees. As you can see, I was studying this week. Do you know where the origin of the light came from on the Christmas tree? Or I should actually say, do you know what the original light that was on the Christmas tree was? A candle. <laughs> it was a candle. They would bring a tree into the house, and they would put a candle on the tree, which I guess made it easier than to understand when to take the tree down. As soon as it lit on fire, he knew it was time to go. Because <laughs> that's another argument. When do you take the tree down? Grant said it was the last, the latest they put their tree up. Well, I can tell you, it'll be up till February. And we'll be sitting there going, take it down already. <laughs> well, back then, if it caught on fire, he knew it was time to take it down. We put ornaments on them. Not only do we light up trees, we light up our houses. Is that weird? We put lights on on houses. We like wrap our houses. I am very much a Scrooge when it comes to this. I will not do it. Just not doing it. So my wife decided to light up the pole that we have in our front yard, you know, with the yard light on it. So if you come by our house, we have twinkling lights on the pole and it looks beautiful actually. We put stockings on our fireplace. We do all sorts of different things that quite frankly are weird. They're weird. There's all sorts of different sights and sounds, things that are strange. One specifically, though, that actually has to do with what we're talking about today, and that's this. Here's something unique that we also do at Christmas. Maybe not all of you do, but some of you do. It's a tradition. It's kind of fun. When you see this picture, what do you think? Santa. Santa. And you specifically think something about Santa. You put this out specifically at a time when you know Santa is coming. This is not something that stays up for 30 days, right? You don't put this out on December 1st. This does not happen the first day of Christmas. This happens when the anticipation is that Santa's about to come. There's an excitement because this jolly man in a red suit with a big white beard is going to show up at my house. It's really, really exciting. But is he really going to come? Really? What if I showed you this picture? What does this picture mean to you? This picture is the Bethlehem star. Does this picture bring the same excitement as the one I just showed you of the picture or the milk and cookies? Is there the same anticipation? Because there should be. There should be the same anticipation because both largely mean the same thing. They both imply that someone is coming. One is factual. One is fictional. Yet they both point to a specific person, with the first picture being way more exciting than the second picture. When I showed the two of them to you, you should be like, oh, this one is way better, way more exciting. But these pictures both symbolize the thought that someone is on their way, that somebody is coming. Which leads us then into the focus of the series in December, and that's this word, Advent. 
This December, we're going to be doing an Advent series starting today, which we've officially deemed the first weekend of Christmas. The word Advent means coming, that something is coming, and is derived from the Latin word Adventus, which literally means coming. Any Advent, then, is looking forward to something that's coming. Christmas is a season of Advent. Christmas is a season anticipating the coming specifically about a person that's going to take place signaled very clearly by a star, not a plate of cookies and milk. See, there were individuals many, many years ago known as the Magi who were watching the heavens, anticipating something to come, and not just something, but someone specifically to come. When that star appeared, it was going to signal the arrival of the Messiah, not Santa. It was a highly anticipated moment that had been foretold for generations, that there was an advent, that there was a coming, that something was about to take place. This Christmas season, we will be celebrating then the Advent, the coming. And depending on your tradition, there are four or five words that are associated with Advent. Those words are faith, hope, love, peace, and joy. Typically, they're used as a set of four. And depending on where you come from, one of the, or a set of these four, not necessarily all of them, some of them in that order, there's one other left out. But these five specifically are encapsulated in almost all traditions of Advent. In fact, you'll notice in this room, we have all five of these words represented. On the wall, we have faith, hope, love, peace, and on the tree, we have joy. We'll discuss them in that order, which might not be the traditional order, but it's the order that we're going to use to take a little bit of a unique look at Advent. So you could kind of call this series then a series about Advent that's loosely affiliated with Advent. So if you have a traditional understanding of how you do Advent, what I found as I've been studying Advent is there is not a traditional way to celebrate Advent. Other than four words and four candles and a wreath and lighting and some of those things, which we're actually going to forego because we're going to focus specifically on these words. These words of Advent. Why are these words important? Why do they matter? What do they have to do with the coming? Well, we're going to take a look at that through this series, beginning today with the words faith and hope, starting specifically with the word faith. So what is faith and what role does it play then in Advent, in the excitement of the coming? Well, faith is defined this way by the dictionary. Faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. We understand faith, specifically this definition of faith. Every day we put our faith in things that is a confidence or a trust in someone or something. When you got here today, you drove here probably in a vehicle of some type. You may have ridden a bike, but each one of those vehicles had brakes on them. When we got into that vehicle or on that vehicle, we put faith in the fact that our brakes would work when we pressed the brake pedals on our way here. We all had faith this morning when you sat down that the chair you were about to sit in would hold you, and they did. We had faith last night that when we went to bed, our heaters would work to keep us warm. And we have faith that when we go to the grocery store in the next couple of weeks to pick up the items we need for all of our holiday baking and cooking, that the item I need will be on the shelf. I have faith in these things, even though there's a chance they will not work. But I have faith because of my previous experience. I have faith because I have used these things, and I know that in what I've done before, it's worked. Which is the type of faith we have in our world today. It's a faith based on what we already know. It's trust and confidence in something. I believe my brakes will work because they have every time I've pressed the brake pedal. I believe my heater will work because it has every time I've turned it on. I believe this grocery store will have what I want because the world I lived in, that has been mostly true. I also believe that chairs will hold me when I sit down because every time I have, I have stayed upright. This is the type of faith that you and I know. This is the kind of faith that we have in our culture today. It is a faith based on trust and confidence because of previous experience. I've done something before, therefore I have faith that it will work again. So how often do we actually put our faith in something that we do not have confidence in? And I would argue rarely ever. In fact, possibly never. Maybe as a little kid, because I didn't have previous experience, I would do things. I'd put faith in things that I did not know about. But as an adult, the answer is I almost never put my faith and trust and confidence in anything I don't already have experience with. In fact, I tried to think about it this week. 
I tried to think about something recently that I put my faith in that I had not had previous experience with, and there literally was nothing that I could come up with. Nothing. I couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't think of anything that I put my faith in that I didn't already know about, especially considering the world we live in today. I really do not do anything anymore based on faith that has no confidence. I do it based on my own knowledge or the knowledge of others, largely because of the invention of places like this. I no longer have faith because I don't need it. I don't need to put my faith in something without trust or confidence because all I got to do is go online and figure out if somebody else already has. With all the reviews and reviewers out there, I never again have to put my faith in something I don't have some knowledge about, whether it be my own knowledge or another's. I'll give you an example. Restaurants. How many people have just randomly rocked into a restaurant recently without knowing what you're walking into? Some of you might be crazy, but most of you, if you're like me, you have not done that. You have not done that. Recently, there was a restaurant that opened here in Woodbury. We were going to go, and there was a long line because it was brand new, and we're standing there. And as we're standing there, we're reading all the reviews about what we we're about to get ourselves into. And the reviews said it was about a 2.5 out of 5, and it was going to be about a 25-minute wait to get what it was that you wanted. And we were like, ah, I don't think I'm going to put my faith in that. And then it said it was overpriced for the flavor, so you might as well go to Culver's. So guess what we did? We went to Culver's. Why? Because we know Culver's, and we've been there before. And it's delicious. Not quite Portillo's, but you know. I don't put my faith in anything anymore that I don't already know about. The dictionary argues, though, that there is a type of faith that we do have, that we put in, that we know nothing about. There's a second definition of faith in the dictionary, and that's this. Faith, a strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion, based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. The dictionary actually has a second definition of faith. First definition is to put my trust in something because of confidence. The second one is that I have a belief in something out of fear, out of apprehension rather than proof, which is the official definition of religious faith in our English dictionary. Religious faith is supposedly a faith based off of apprehension and no proof which I would say is what many would call a blind faith. A blind faith. A faith that has no confidence, no trust, and no proof. In fact, a good majority of our culture believes that faith in any type of God is blind. It's blind. This would include faith in the God of the Bible. Is this the type of faith, then, that we're supposed to have as we talk about Advent and faith? Is this the type of faith that we're supposed to have when we believe in God? Is this the type of faith that we're talking about at Christmas? And the answer is no, it's not. It's not. In fact, I believe it's nearly impossible for human beings, based on the very nature of who we are as people, to actually have blind faith. I don't believe there is such a thing as blind faith. I think we've actually blinded ourselves by telling ourselves that we can have blind faith. I don't think we can. In fact, as we just saw a moment ago, it's really difficult today specifically to blindly put our faith in anything and to think that I actually can do something that goes against my very nature as human beings. Pretty much everything I do, I do because either somebody else has done it or I've done it before. And I did it before because I knew that it was to be trustworthy. So try to put your faith in something you do not have confidence in. I don't actually think you can do it. And if you do, I would tell you not to. Don't. That's dumb. Don't do it. Know what you're getting yourself into. Have the type of faith that has trust and confidence. So is that the type of faith that the Bible asks of us? A faith that's not blind, but a faith that is based off of, some, off of something. And the answer is yes. In fact, the Bible tells us exactly what kind of faith that we're supposed to have. And it's not blind. So this morning, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. If you don't have a Bible, I can give you one. We've got one in the room. If you want a hard copy, if you're at home, I'd love to send you one. Hope is and desire is that everybody would come in here with a Bible. Everybody would leave with a Bible. If you don't want a hard copy, download one on any smart device. The notes up here with me today will be in the app, the Bible app on any smart device. Go into events, New Life Church of Woodbury. If you go into extras, events, New Life Church of Woodbury, we're going to be there. You can take these notes with you. And the hope is, the reason we give away a Bible every week 
is so that we will read it, not just on Sundays, but every day, because if you do, I guarantee it will change your life. So Hebrews 11, 1 through 2, two very small verses that speak very loudly, says this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Again, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This is the type of faith that Scripture calls for. This passage here in Hebrew begins what is known as the faith chapter. It's a chapter that lists out all the greatest people of faith in all of Scripture. And at the very beginning of this chapter, it tells us exactly what faith is. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It is not blind faith. See, Scripture never once asks us to have a blind faith. In fact, it desires what I would call a biblical faith, a faith that is confident and assured about what's going to happen, a faith that has confidence and assurance, which this beginning chapter or beginning verse of this chapter here tells us that this is the type of faith that the ancients were commended for. It's not a faith that blindly followed, but a faith that had confidence and assurance, a faith that had confidence and assurance that there would be an advent. See, most all of Scripture points to the fact that something was coming. There would be a coming that would happen, and the ancients were confident in this because their Scriptures, the Old Testament, from beginning to end, speak of the fact that there was going to be a coming, that there was going to be an advent, that there was going to be a Messiah. And they were confident and assured that this was going to happen, and so they watched for it. They wanted to see it. They were looking in the sky. They were waiting for a star. They were hoping that their Messiah would come, and their prophets spoke about it. From the very beginning all the way to the end, their prophets spoke that there would be a coming. And there was a prophet specifically by the name of of Isaiah who is an expert in this coming and speaks very clearly throughout his book of what this coming would look like. He tells us very clearly the very beginning of this coming would start this way. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. This coming would come with a baby. This advent would start with a baby. The faith that the ancients had was looking for one that would come who would be born. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the advent that they had faith would take place. A king would come and sit on the throne of David David, and would establish it and reign forever. The faith that the ancients had in what was unseen, that a child would come and be king, became seen. And his imminent coming is foretold quite dramatically in the New Testament, as described by Luke at the very beginning of his book. Luke 1, 26-38, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. A baby was coming. And you were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word, be to, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. An angel visits Mary and tells her she's about to conceive the child that her people have been looking for, which would fulfill the words of Isaiah. A baby was coming. 
a son was to be born. And he was going to sit on the throne of David, and he was going to establish his reign forever and ever and ever. The advent, the coming of the Messiah is about to take place, and Mary is the vehicle by which this baby will come. Her response, though, to this announcement is, how can this be? How can I know? And the angel responds by reminding her of what she can put her trust and confidence in. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, for no word from God will ever fail. The angel here tells Mary what to put her faith in, which is exactly what the ancients had put their faith in and what we today put our faith in, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. See, faith in God is confident and trusting because of the Word of God and the fact that it will never fail because it never has and it never will which is the faith that we have at Christmas, that the Messiah has come and the word of God through Isaiah and the angel has been fulfilled because they both said it's going to happen. The one thousands of years ago and then the one looking at Mary saying, you will be the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, that a child will be born, that the advent is about to happen and that you will be the vehicle by which it will. And she says, how do I know? And he says, because the word of God will not fail. See, this Christmas season is about confident and trustworthy faith. When we think about faith at Advent, it's not a blind faith. It's a confident faith. It's a trustworthy faith. Because instead of being based on the words of humans, it's based on the words of God, which will never, ever, 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 ever fail. As we have faith then during Advent, our faith leads to hope. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Not only did they have faith that was confident, but they had hope. They had hope and assurance about what they did not see. See, often when people think of hope, they think of hope as kind of a wishing. As we think of faith as being blind, we think of hope, specifically from a religious perspective, being as wishing. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. I really want to get that gift that's under the tree. I really hope that what I believe comes true. I want, I want, I want. See, if I hope in something, many awfully wrongly think that I wish it would come true. I wish it would happen. I hope it happens. Hoping and wishing, though, are two very different things. See, when you see the Bethlehem star, it should bring a confident hope. It should bring an understanding, a knowledge of truth rather than a wishing hope. We don't look at the Bethlehem star and say, I wish I may, I wish I might have this wish I wish tonight. That's not how it works. We look at the Bethlehem star going, the hope that I have and the fact that a Messiah would come has taken place and it is trustworthy. I then have hope for something more. I don't wish, I know. And that is the kind of Christmas hope. Christmas hope is not wishful thinking, but rather a secure assurance. I don't go into Christmas with a blind faith. I don't go into Christmas with a hope that's just wishing. I go into Christmas with a confident and trusting faith, and I go into Christmas with an assurance of what's to come in the hope that I have. See, the star reminds us of the fact that what was to come now has, and that we have seen the Messiah, and his name is Jesus. That the first advent has taken place. That what the ancients put their faith and hope in has happened. And those that were with Jesus proclaimed this very clearly. 1 John 1, 1 through 4, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That was what's from the beginning. The word was in the beginning. God's word was trustworthy. Jesus was there, which they had heard, which they had seen, which they had looked at, their hands had touched, which they proclaimed concerning the word of life, that the life appeared, that we've seen it, and we testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship with is, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Quite possibly one of the greatest reviews ever written. You want to know if Jesus is real and you can put your hope and trust in him? Read this review. What if somebody had put this on Facebook or Google or Yelp? Would you believe it? 
Probably. And yet because it's written in the word of God, often people dismiss it saying, oh, that can't be true. They didn't know what they were talking about. Well, should we do the same thing with all the reviews that we read then? All the things we read on Facebook and Google and Yelp, should we disregard those because there's no way they could know what they're talking about? I should have stayed at that restaurant and gotten the food because I shouldn't have put my faith in what they had said. And yet that's not like us. That's not how we act as humans. We actually take the words of others as important because it is. And so these words, this review very clearly proclaims that the one that they had been waiting for, they had seen, they had touched. They had heard, they had spent time with, and they needed to proclaim it to the whole world. John specifically, who wrote this book, disciple of Jesus Christ, known as the disciple that Jesus loved, is sitting here going, I have to tell you this because it will make our joy complete. You have to know that the one we've been waiting for, the one who is coming at the first advent, the one that we've been anticipating from the very beginning has been here. We have seen him, we have touched him, we have heard him, and you need to know about him. What an incredible review. Absolutely incredible. Because the faith that the word of God was true had led them to the hope that was coming, that it would come to pass, that the Messiah would be here. And the truth about who they were looking for lay in this man named Jesus. They heard him, they saw him, they touched him, they spent time with him, and they knew that he had been with the Father. See, the ancients' faith and hope going into the first advent then can be summed up this way very clearly. Their faith was a biblical faith, not a blind faith. And their hope was an assured hope, not wishful thinking. As we think about those that had gone before, that had put their faith and hope in what was to come, we can read through Hebrews 11 of all of those that were in the hall of faith, as it's known, the chapter of faith, and we can know that their faith was not a blind faith. Their faith was based in the word of God and scripture, that something was to come, and their hope was not wishful thinking. Please, 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 please. Their hope was assurance and knowledge and understanding that the word of God would be fulfilled. As we stand here now then, we are like those before Christ that were waiting for the first advent. Because we, too, have faith and hope in an Advent. See, Advent at Christmas is a big deal because there's two Advents. See, in Christianity, there are two different Advents. The first Advent we've already witnessed. In fact, we celebrate it at Christmas with the arrival of Jesus. Whereas the second Advent we are still waiting for. As you and I stand here today, we live in the middle of two Advents. There was a first coming and there is a second coming. In the Old Testament, we're told of the first advent, whereas the New Testament tells us of a second advent. Advent translates in the New Testament to this word, parousia, parousia. Parousia in the New Testament is predominantly used to refer to the second coming of Christ, the second advent. Just as Mary and the Israelites had put their faith in the fact that the Messiah was coming once, we put our faith and hope in the fact that he will come again. Not a blind faith, not a wishful hope. A biblical faith, an assured hope that there will be a second coming. This faith and hope is predicated on the same promise that Mary had, for no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. Our hope and faith of a second advent lies in the fact that these words are still true and that no word of God will ever fail as his words continue to come true which is the beauty of Scripture, the beauty of the Bible, the beauty of the season that we live in today, is that we are still living it. That as we read the Bible, it's not a document that died thousands of years ago when it was closed. It's not a document that has gone away, that is no longer relevant to us, because we're right in the middle of the story. We're sitting here today waiting for words to still come true that were written thousands of years ago with the knowledge that because of the ones that were written even longer, because we've seen those come true, that we can know that the ones we're still waiting for, we can have a biblical faith and an assured hope that they too will come true. And there are words all over the New Testament telling us about the parousia, the second advent, the second coming. Revelation 1, 7, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Matthew 24, 26 through 27, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. 
For as lightning comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Luke 21, 25 through 28, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. This is the second advent, and it's exciting. It's exciting. There are so many woos inside of me right now that if I were to let them all out, it would be hopefully contagious. that we have something to look forward to because of the fact that there was a first advent. Because of the first advent, we can get excited. We can have faith and hope that because Jesus has come once, he will come again, just as it was told he would. The word of God through the prophet Isaiah and other prophets prophets told us the Messiah would come. The ancients put their faith and hope in the fact that he would, and he did. And now we trust the word of God today the very same way they did as we wait for the second advent. See, the purpose of the first advent was that Jesus would come and save his people from their sin. And that he would set the captives free. And all of that was accomplished in his work on the cross. The second advent is also about saving, but in a little bit of a different sort of way. Hebrews 9, 28 tells us very clearly what the second advent is going to be about. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See, we anticipate the second coming because we will receive the salvation we are waiting for. What are we being saved from? Well, if we believe that Jesus has already freed us from sin, we believe that the work on the cross that he did is sufficient to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, we now wait for our full salvation, which is ultimately the fact that we will be freed from this place. That we will be freed from this place. You see, the true hope of Christmas that we have is that there is something beyond this life. But there is something beyond this life. See, the importance of the first advent was that it was heavily anticipated because the Jewish people were exiles. They were foreigners. They were strangers. They did not belong in the land they were in. And they were longing for their king to come and bring them home. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us this about those who had great faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 through 16. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking about the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. See, this is the same desire today for those that believe. We, ladies and gentlemen, are exiles. We're foreigners. We're strangers who do not belong here on earth. And our longing is for our king to come and bring us home. This is the excitement and anticipation of Christmas. Because the one who came once has promised to come again. And the words of God do not fail. This week, my uh, family's been going through a a fairly tough situation because of the outlook for a really good friend of ours. I think I've shared her name with you. Her name is Sarah. A number of years ago, at 22 years old, Sarah was diagnosed with cancer. Sarah has fought really, really hard. Over Thanksgiving break, the bottom fell out, and she's losing her battle. At 26 years old, Sarah's about ready to go home. 
through the whole process, she's been blogging and telling her journey and sharing the hope and encouragement that she has in Christ. At such a young age, she has wisdom beyond any of our years. And a couple weeks ago, as she could see the end coming, she wrote a blog saying she was ready. Because she knew this place was not her home. And she was excited about the day that she was going to go home and be there and see her Savior once again, knowing that once she arrives, she would never want to come back. And yet, it's hard. Because one of the things that's easy for us to do is to believe that this is our home. This excitement for something more beyond this life often gets lost in our culture today, especially at Christmas, because our current Christmas celebrations try to get us to believe that this is our home. They lull us into a false sense that what we are looking for is here on earth and that this is where we belong. We do all sorts of special things. We decorate our homes. We make it feel cozy. We sit around the fire. We do something weird with chestnuts. We surround ourselves with friends and family and we give ourselves more stuff so that we will feel good and comfortable feeling like this is where we belong. We then make statements like this that we repeat over and over and over again and we soon believe them. I will be home for Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. All I want for Christmas is you. No. No. This isn't the essence of Christmas. See, all I want for Christmas is for Jesus to come back so I can go home. Because this is not where I belong. This is not my home. And I wait and long for something so much better. Which I should do even more at Christmas. Because Jesus has come once and he's coming again. And I can't wait. Now, don't get me wrong. We are to enjoy life. We are to enjoy life, and we are to live it to its fullest. But we have to understand and remember that this is not our home, that we are aliens and strangers, and we are to not get comfortable here. We are to make the most of every day, complete the work that God has for us while we're still here, to be people like those in Hebrews 11, to be like the ancients, longing and hoping for something to come, knowing that this is not the country we belong in. Knowing that it's not the United States, it's not Mexico, it's not any of the teams playing in the World Cup, that's not your home. It's a heavenly one, a nation we have yet to enter, but one that we should long for, because when we get there, we will finally, truly belong. So this Christmas season, then, let's practice Advent. Let's remember the first coming of Christ to save us from our sin and then focus on the second Advent of Christ, which is the hope that we have at Christmas, that there is something beyond this life because you and I are not home. So this Christmas, then, we have a challenge. And our challenge is to put our faith in what we cannot see and our hope in what is beyond because of the advent that we anticipate at Christmas. See, Jesus didn't come to make us comfortable here. He didn't come so that we would decorate our homes and make them feel even cozier, which my wife does a really good job of. When she decorates for Christmas, I don't want to leave. And yet then when I read the story of my friend Sarah, I long for the day when I'll be gone. I long for the day when this will no longer be my home. Because what's to come is so much better than what we have right now. So last week, we ended the service singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Because it led us into the Advent season and is thought to be the Advent song of Christmas. It's thought to be the Advent song of Christmas because it's the longing of looking forward to the Savior coming for Israel. Today, it's also our song because of the anticipation of the second coming. O come, e come, O come, O come, Emmanuel. So as we sing this song at the end of the service today, I want us to sing it with a little bit of a different perspective. 
a perspective that longs for and puts our faith in what we cannot see, not a blind faith, a biblical faith, knowing that because of the first advent, there will be a second advent. And then we put our hope in something beyond this world because this is not our home, not a wishful hope, but a confident and assured hope for what is to come because we know it will happen. So when we do that, when we put our faith and hope in what is to come, we will experience Christmas in a way that we never have before. And it will lead us to our third word, love. And hopefully a way we've never seen that before either. So what does that third word have to do with Advent? It's a great question. Come back next week and find out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you're a God that loves us and knows us and is with us right here, right now. As we stand between two Advents, we have a biblical faith and assured hope of what's to come because of what we have already witnessed. That your words are true, your words through Isaiah, your words to Mary have come true. That the first advent has taken place and we celebrate that at Christmas. That a baby was born, the ruler of the world, to sit on the throne forever and ever. And so we look back at the first advent with confidence, Lord, of the second advent. As we're stuck in between the two advents, I pray that you will make us uncomfortable, that you help us see that this world is not our home, that we will long for the day that you will return again, and that we will have faith and hope that you will, because your word will never fail, ever. So I pray today, Lord, that we will sing loud and make it our anthem as we beg of you, O come, O come, Emmanuel and that you will be with us once again, and we will finally be home in a place that we belong, unlike any other. Thank you so much for who you are. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing loud with me today.
I enjoy about Christmas is it is one of the greatest times of the year. But that should give us perspective of what eternity will actually be like. Take the best thing that you know. Take the thing you love most about Christmas and multiply it by a billion. Multiply it by infinity. And that's what we have to look forward to. The family, the fun, the food, the festivities here on earth is nothing like the things that we will enjoy someday. And so as you leave today, enjoy this season. But may it be something that creates a longing inside of you for what's beyond. Because we have a faith and a hope that there will be a second advent and we long for that day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the Christmas season. We thank you for the idea of Advent, that you have come once and you're coming again. And so I pray as we leave here today, as we enjoy this season, Lord, that you will create in us a longing for something more. That we will look beyond the situation we're in right now, that we will know that there is more to come and that we will get excited for the day that you return or the day that we meet you before then. Because you came once to free us from our sins and you're coming again to free us from this place. So this Christmas season, I pray we long for that advent, for that coming, that Lord, you inspire inside of us a desire for you that is beyond anything we've ever understood. And then we put our faith and our hope in your word, in your promises, because they have come true till now. And they will never fail for the end of all eternity. So Lord, may we be a people full of excitement and joy at Christmas in a way that nobody else has. Because of Advent, the coming, the first and the second. And may we be people then, Lord, that lives it out loud and shows the world our faith and hope so that when they see us, they'll see you through us. We thank you, we praise you, we give it all to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You guys have a great week. See you next weekend.